Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'd like to welcome all of the journalists here and, of course, our distinguished guests, participants in today's uh, press conference. Today we have um, this uh, event devoted to this anniversary, 20, 20th anniversary since uh, the uh, CTBT opened for signature in April, uh, Russian president. Uh, uh, addressed leaders of all uh, countries to show political will and, as, uh, and join this uh, treaty as soon as uh, possible. And let me remind you that uh, Russia ha ratified this document 15 years ago. And let me introduce to you our guests uh, this afternoon. Next to me, uh, Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission of uh, CTBT organization, Lasina Zerbo. Thank you, Mr. Zerbo. It's not your first time in Moscow. It's not your time, uh, not your first time as our guest. That's very good. And our second uh, guest, who is here for the first time, but we're also glad and we welcome him. We have the executive uh, chairperson of UN uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, Verification and Inspection Commission, Mr. Hans Blix, and uh, from 1981 until 1997, he had been the Foreign Minister of uh, Sweden, and until from 1991 and uh, 1997, he was also the uh, IAEA. Uh, General Director, and f I'd like to start this conference with the following question. The goal of your visit to Moscow this time, what kind of meetings have you already had and what is in the plans? Mr. Zerbo, please uh, go first. First, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me again and uh, joining me, uh, Dr. Blix, uh, who is a member of the, the group of uh, eminent person of the CTBT. Uh, the reason why we're here today is uh, uh, we're coming to a seminar organized by the Center for Energy and Security St uh, Studies, uh, which is chaired by uh, Anton Klopkov. And uh, it was basically featuring uh, my good friend, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Sergei Ryabkov, uh, with whom we've uh, just published uh, uh, an op-ed uh, talking about the status of the CTBT and then the 20th anniversary, and then where do we go from now, and uh, the achievement. And also uh, giving an opportunity to exchange with uh, Russian think tanks, and uh, talking indeed about uh, Russian unwavering commitment uh, to this treaty, the CTBT, as mentioned by President Putin a week ago. I think uh, it was quite timely that uh, those events uh, uh, coincide so much uh, to a point where we able to discuss those issues and then see where we where we go from here, and then take stock of what was achieved uh, for the past 20 years. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Blix uh, or Dr. Blix. Please uh, follow up on what has been said. Since the comprehensive test ban treaty was concluded that would prohibit all states in the world from testing nuclear weapons. And that treaty has been signed and ratified by a great many states, but not by all. Indeed, eight countries still need to ratify it, and among them China and the United States. And uh, the question is pressing. How can we get this treaty into force? Because there is a risk, a certain risk, that one country would start testing again. Today, I think there are worries. First, that if it is not in force, then if anyone starts testing, it will trigger others. And we are maybe in for a nu new nuclear arms race to smaller nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, and I think no one in the world really would like to have such a new nuclear arms race, especially since the tensions in the world is severe. The other major risk relates to the situation in the Far East, Northeast Asia, where North Korea is the only country that in the last decade or more has tested any weapons. And this, if they continue with this, that risks also to stimulate or induce other countries, notably Japan and South Korea, may say that we want to have our own nuclear weapons. 
They do not do that now, but that's a risk. And if that were to happen, then the situation in the Far East would be much, much more tense than it is in today. So we have all the very strong reasons to try to persuade uh, the great powers and uh, the others to join in ratification of the of this CTBT. And it's how we go about that that we've been discussing here. Uh, let me continue this uh, session of questions from me. What do you think Russia can do for this CTBT uh, and for other countries to join it, uh, primarily permanent members of the Security Council, uh, the People's Republic of China in the US? Russia and UK and France have ratified the CTBT, but it doesn't enter into force until you have a sufficient number. What can these countries do at the current time? Well, to me, there is an encouragement in what the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, have achieved in some other areas. Now, I take first the case of the use of chemical weapons in Syria, when the Russia and the United States together uh, managed with an operation, and with a diplomatic operation, I should say, that eliminated the chemical weapons from Syria. And this was legitimized then by the, P by the Security Council. This was the first. The second one was the long negotiations that occurred with Iran about the nuclear program in Iran, in which the permanent members again, and uh, notably the United States and, and Russia, but also Europe and others, where they succeeded to get an agreement on settling the nuclear issue in Iran. The third case, I think, is the one we see now that is very shaky, and that relates to a ceasefire in Syria. Again, it is the United States and Russia that have taken the initiative to it. We hope that will work out uh, for everybody. But it's clear that these countries that have very tense and difficult relations in many other areas, that they are capable of isolating issues which are difficult and which are dangerous, in which they have a common in interest in diffusing issues. And they have succeeded in that. And we think that the com and ratification and entry into force of the comprehensive test ban and the solution of the North Korean situation is are among those important issues that they should tackle. Just. Uh, just to add on what uh, Dr. Bliss said, what Russia can do, I think uh, uh, the three examples uh, that uh, Dr. Bliss mentioned uh, as uh, sending us to the leadership that uh, the big players uh, can take, especially members of the Security Council or under the non-proliferation treaty, what we call the P5 nuclear power countries. Uh, we talk about Syria, Iran, and then now the ceasefire. But I wanted to add another major event uh, where uh, the big players have intervened together with the support of the, the, the whole international community is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So when world leaders get together, and then with the support of the international community, we achieve a lot. What we are asking Russia, and this is part of the discussion we're having right now, is Russia to take leadership on the issue of the CTBT, especially in the context of the DPRK uh, that is now uh, conducted uh, nuclear test explosion, at least the way they've announced it so far. And then right now there are tensions uh, in the media, and what we're hearing is that there's a possibility of another test. So I think it's about time, and it's a matter of urgency that we do something with DPRK through dialogue, and I think the CTBT could offer that platform. Yes, you already mentioned the situation with uh, uh, DPRK uh, nuclear program, and since the beginning of the year, the world's been watching uh, what is happening there on uh, January the 6th nuclear test and uh, missile launches. Do you think there is a chance to put uh, uh, DPRK to the negotiations uh, table? And who has the key to uh, solving this issue, Mr. Br uh, Dr. Briggs, uh, Blix? It's a drawn-out issue and a very difficult one. Uh, I think that generally international affairs, the principle of carrots and sticks are the combination that one uses. 
And uh, North Korea is concerned about its security, or at least it says that it's concerned about its security. Remember still the Korean War in 1950, and they uh, feel that they are still un under threat. So part of the uh, a solution, possible solution, I think, to be to give North Korea a security uh, that they will not be attacked from the outside or that the outside world will not instigate a uh, uprising from the inside. And in fact, that should not be so difficult because the UN Charter prohibits states from uh, the encroaching upon each other's territory. Uh, so it should be possible. And the US, in fact, has also shown that they are uh, would be ready to conclude a peace treaty with North Korea. So security, I think, is an important element of it. But the other element is then assistance. North Korea is in a very difficult and dire economic and social uh, situation. And the, uh, they have received much assistance from abroad, but they would need much more assistance in order to bring the country to some reasonable international standard of living. And I think that the outside world would be ready to, to do so. That's the, the less dif difficult part of it. The security aspect is the more difficult. Please. Yeah, security aspect, I mean, it all boils down to uh, trust, mutual trust. I mean, that's what uh, uh, North Korea is after. Uh, when Dr. Bliss says that uh, they want to get uh, the assurance that they will not be attacked, I think we have to work towards creating those conditions. And how do we create that in the current uh, geopolitical uh, situation? Uh, we've had various experts talking about uh, different ways of uh, addressing the issue of TPRK. But from the CTBT perspective, what I want to, to point out is the following. Uh, should we let the status quo continue in a situation where they will do potentially, as announced right now, a fifth test, and maybe a six or a seven, bearing in mind that the more tests they do, the more they gain the capability of developing nuclear weapons and then making those weapons more powerful. So what, it, what does the international community want and what do they want to do? What we want is to stop what could be another triggering factor for an arms race. Because if North Korea is able to do it without any mechanism to put an end to the testing from that peninsula, I think we might see a situation where other may see ways of carrying those type of tests. So the only way to do that is through dialogue. And your question was, how do we bring them through dialogue? I mean, the same way we managed to bring Iran around the table and then to discuss uh, with the 5 plus 1 or 3 plus 3, I'd call in, the, in Europe, I think we can do the same. We can find a way to resume the six-party talks. How do we find that way? We offer a platform. And we at the CTBT, uh, CTBT at 20, as we say, in June 13, we're calling upon all actors in arms control and non-proliferation to come and reflect on where the CTBT stands today and where can we go from now. And if we offer this platform, it could be a platform to bring a discussion on the DPRK and then find an embryonic way of uh, uh, restarting uh, the six-party talk uh, to that effect. Yeah, there are intermediate steps towards a full ratification by North Korea. And uh, one measure talked about is a moratorium. There is a moratorium in the world about nuclear testing. Uh, North Korea has ignored it. Would there be some way of getting North Korea to accept and observe the moratorium in return for something else? And one suggestion has been that the other side, the US and South Korean side, could then suspend the military exercises that they have annually. That might be one way. Uh, maybe there could be something else uh, offered as well. So it's not a cut and dried one solution, but there are also intermediate solutions that can be tried. And I agree with the Latino Serbo that dialogue is necessary, hoping that it will lead to a more extensive discussion about the solution security situation in the northeast corner of, of Asia. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I don't want to usurp my right to ask you questions. And now I have my uh, journalist uh, colleagues here in the room. Now you have it's your chance to ask them questions. Please raise your hands and introduce themselves. Let's see if we have any questions. And now it's row two. Thank you very much for your interesting introductory uh, presentations. Mr. Zerbo, uh, we've known you for many years uh, as a peacekeeper. My name is Isa. Isa, I'm an independent journalist. I'm a Russian of Syrian origin. And uh, you already mentioned the withdrawal of chemical weapons from the Syrian uh, Arab uh, Republic. It was uh, at the initiative of Mr. Putin, approved or uh, with uh, Mr. Assad. Of course, there was some pressure from the US in that situation, but we'll see now chemical weapons have been uh, removed from uh, Syria and immediately Neither Putin nor Assad had known that uh, the U.S. was doing that, but we see how uh, this uh, logical uh, Russian uh, policy, uh, foreign policy and diplomacy, and that they have human face, they are of humane nature as opposed to this uh, policy of the U.S. And we have seen how the chemi chemical weapons were removed, and it seemed to be fine, but that then they immediately brought even more destructive weapons in. And what I mean here is ISIS or Daesh. Uh, in your opinion, how long will the US continue to have this uh, uh, this uh, policy of not just double but triple standards what can we do with the US for them to join this uh, treaty and how long will they continue to continue behaving in this uh, away as if they are the global policemen, in your opinion. Thank you. About two uh, matters that are not directly linked. The first is about the chemical weapons in Syria and what followed. And the other is about the U.S. joining and ratifying the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I mentioned the Syrian situation uh, because I think it is a good example, a very good example, of how a very tense and dangerous situation could have developed into something very ugly if there had not been this agreement and if the Russia and the United States not, had not both weighed in with their influence on the situation. And we'll remember that President Obama had stated that if Syria were to use uh, weapons of mass destruction that would alter his calculation, which would have taken as a, as a threat that the United States would attack Syria. And instead of that, there was an agreement between the US and Russia to exert that influence to get Syria to ratify the Convention Against Chemical Weapons, and this was carried out even during a civil war. That was a, a very great event, and I think that one reason why Obama was anxious to have this solution, he said recently that he was proud of the decision that they did not go in with weapons, that they went for the diplomatic solution. One reason was that if they had bombed uh, targets in Syria, no one knows where it would have ended. It's easy to start a war, but it's very also easy that it go on. I think he was influenced by that. And he also said that he was influenced by the fact that it, they would not have had authorization from the United Nations to do it. And I think that was an important uh, part of it. So to us, in this context of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, what the Syrian case shows is that cooperation between Russia and the United States in an isolated case, in an area where they are still very much against each other in other conflicts, nevertheless, they are succeeding in isolating it. And this is what we now think they need to do in regarding the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. 
Now, as to the U.S. Senate, I think it is the policy of the, of the Obama administration to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. President Clinton failed in that in 1999, I think it was. The Senate rejected it, and I'm sure that no American president would like to bring it to the Senate without a certainty that they would get it through. Today, they would not get such a certainty, and that's why they do not submit it to the Senate. But we also hear that Rose Gottemüller, who was the representative of Carnegie here in Moscow and who negotiated the START Treaty, that she is carrying out what she terms an educational phase in, in the United States. And I think that with the awareness, the growing awareness in the U.S. about the danger of a new arms race and the danger in Northeast Asia, that, yes, within time, not, not before the presidential election, certainly not, but within thereafter a new election, there might be a better hope for it. And meanwhile, perhaps the P5 can work for a strengthening of the moratorium that we have. I mean, two points that I would like to, to add. If I start with Syria, uh, the point that I want to add is that uh, Syria uh, happened uh, in terms of dismantling the chemical weapon because there was a, a catastrophe, uh, because we waited for a disaster in the use of chemical weapon before the international community reacted and then uh, get on to uh, uh, securing the, the removal of uh, the chemical arsenal and then getting uh, Bashar to sign the chemical weapon convention. So uh, I want to link two other issues to that. The first is that we missed an opportunity to move from the chemical to the nuclear field because we could have had Syria to sign and ratify the CTBT and then any other arms control treaty instead of only focus, uh, focusing on the chemical issue. So we missed that opportunity. But we don't have to wait for a disaster, for a nuclear detonation before we react on treaties like the CTBT or beyond. Or we don't have to wait for terrorists to put a hand on fissile material and then start worrying about uh, them using dirty bomb. I think we don't do that because the Nuclear Security Summit is taking care of this. What we need is the same leadership that we've shown on Syria, the same leadership that we're showing on nuclear security to start something like that for other arms control treaty, meaning the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and then the FMCT, the Fissile Material Cut-Off Treaty as well. And then the world will show that they care about international stability, they care about peace and security, they care about arms control, and then they care about non-proliferation. This is what we need. Another thing that I want to, to point out here is uh, the fact that the CTBT is suffering from uh, what uh, uh, I think one of the governors in the United States has called public unawareness. Not many people know of the CTBT. But there are very few people who knew about the Chemical Weapon Convention too, until we had Syria. We are in this 21st century where we tend to wait for crisis before we react. And that's what we have to avoid. And I think the education campaign, campaign that Rose Gottmuller is doing in the US is important. But that same education campaign should, campaign should go around the world for people to know that there is a treaty that is seen today as an unfinished business. We say that this was the longest fought and the hardest, uh, I don't know, agreement uh, to have brought the CTBT for signature. We have to take it that the fact that it took that long, it's because the treaty is important for arms control and non-proliferation. We shouldn't forget, forget that the treaty is yet to enter into force. Until it enters into force, we don't have a legal framework to stop nuclear testing. And then we have North Korea testing today. The only legally binding framework that will stop any other country from testing is a comprehensive test ban treaty. And I think it's about time that we get the necessary leadership to get it into force. Спасибо, господин Зербо. Да, пожалуйста. Только In your opinion, what's happening now in Syria, is it not a disaster? In your, you never mentioned ISIS or Daesh. Russia is helping. Russia is fighting terrorism and the ISIS. And the US is feeding them. 
cultivating them, giving them money, and instead of uh, humanitarian aid, they uh, deliver weapons, including lethal weapons there. Don't you think uh, it's a disaster what's happening in Syria? Thank you. I think there has been a disaster for a very long time in Syria. It started as an uprising against the autocratic regime, an oppressive regime of Bashar al-Assad. And uh, it developed into a civil war with interventions from the outside. Uh, Saudi Arabia, notably, uh, on the one hand, and Iran on the other hand. So it was a sort of proxy war between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. And I think it is, would have been desirable perhaps if the US and Russia earlier had been able to exercise their leverage against these two states to reduce the fighting. Now ISIS has turned up in the, in the whole thing. I think that the coming of ISIS is in part a result of the occupation of Iraq when uh, many disgruntled Syri Sunni forces were freed and, and this man taken out of the army. But that's where we are now. And I think that it, Russia and the United States are trying hard, both of them, unfortunately, to try both to combat ISIS and the al-Nusra front, and at the same time to get some kind of transitory arrangement. This is positive, but it's very difficult because there are many players. Uh, Turkey is another one that seems to sometimes to be more worried about the uh, ah, the Tur Kurds than, uh, than about others. So getting this jigsaw puzzle together is not easy, but it requires certainly as a center goodwill and cooperation of the US and Russia, regardless of how they look upon things in the Ukraine or elsewhere. I mean, the, the what to your question as well, I think we're all concerned about what's happening in, uh, in Syria uh, after uh, the issue of the, the chemical weapon a couple of years ago. Uh, it is true that with Daesh and ISIS, it's not only a problem for Syria, it's a problem for the whole international community. Uh, but uh, we see some encouraging uh, 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 talks among the world leaders because uh, we saw in the media today that there is a readout of a phone call between President Putin and President Obama where Syria was mentioned. So let's hope that that's uh, the start uh, to see a brighter uh, light in uh, a sort of agreement in this region to deal with ISIS and Daesh because uh, they're not only affecting uh, the Syrian region, but they're affecting the whole region in the Middle East and then getting down to, to other parts of the world. And then we all, we all see that as a concern for the international community. I understand the questions that were asked by our Syrian colleague. They are a matter of concern for him because it's a point of uh, his motherland. But let's uh, get back to our main topic. We are talking about CTBT. And here's uh, what I can uh, could ask you, Mr. Zerbo. After CTBT comes into force, of course, after it's ratified by the countries who hadn't done it yet, the organization of CTBT will have a unique mode of control to detect all nuclear explosions. The monitoring or uh, verification mode is existing even now. Now already you can use different stations to monitor the level and uh, power of explosions that do take place. Let's go back to uh, North uh, Korea and to that test that took place on the 6th of uh, January. Back then they said it was thermal nuclear explosion, but many uh, experts doubted that. They said that the capacity was not, the power was not uh, big enough. Please uh, throw some light here. What kind of explosion was that? Was that really powerful? Was that really of thermal uh, nuclear nature? First of all, let me go to our verification uh, regime and then the international monitoring system. Uh, this morning, Dr. Bliss was talking about the unique nature of uh, the organization framework that we have right now. 
the treaty is yet to enter in force, but the organization is fully operational. Let's put it this way. When I say fully, we've put in place all the mechanism, technological mechanism, to be able to detect any nuclear test explosion anywhere on Earth, underground, underwater, and in the air, together with the national technical means of the countries. So we're pretty confident at 90% that we're able to do so. So we've put in the hand of the international community the deterrent to any potential country who would like to violate, violate this treaty. So that's the main achievement of the international community with regard to the CTBT and its international monitoring system right now. But how far this international monitoring goes, I think that boasts to your question with regard to whether we're dealing with the thermonuclear tests or not. First, I would like to say we shouldn't even dealing with a test to start with. Any tests shouldn't be in this 21st century in the first place. The CTBT and its verification regime, the international monitoring system, is not in a position or not set or tuned to go in a difference between a thermo or a hydro or whatever bomb uh, we can talk about. What we care for is to stop any nuclear text explosion in the process to develop a nuclear weapon. It is true, we've all heard about the speculation that this explosion wasn't big enough uh, to be a thermonuclear explosion. So we don't go to that level of detail because that's beyond what the CTBT mandate is for. Our mandate is to make sure no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. And that's why so far the CTBT has not been part of this debate between a thermo, uh, whether it's a boosted bomb, whether it's not. We're just listening to the international community and listening to the expert and then try to tune it with the, uh, the fact that we have the technical specification and let it at the, at the disposal of the international community for their own qualitative judgment. But maybe Dr. Blix has something to say. Thank you. Well, only this, that today the verification mechanisms in the CDBD organization are far more developed than they were in the 90s. One of the objections in the United States to ratifying the CDBD in the 90s was that they were not quite convinced that the organization would be able to de detect any de explosions. Today, I don't think they say that. And in fact, in the United States, the laboratories that deal with nuclear weapons and also a great many of the military are of the view that the United States should ratify it. So the resistance to ratification in the US, I think, is more to be found at the political level in the Senate than in many other, other places. Now, the, I was, of course, in charge of the International Atomic Energy Agency as a director general for, for many years, from 1981 to 97. And we used to speak there about the safeguards inspection, uh, which also has developed, partly in thanks, thanks to the events in Iraq. We talked about safeguards as being the constituting the deterrent from violation by the risk of detection. Um, here's the same thing. There is a, anyone who might be tempted to hide a test, they will be deterred from it because they know that the means of detection are, are so, so strong. So I think the ship is in a good shape. <laughs> and the question is whether all the, all the other ships are willing to be, accept the order. Спасибо. На первый ряд, пожалуйста, микрофон. Roman Melnik from Rare Lands magazine. I have two brief questions. 20 years is uh, uh, long enough to understand that some countries are going to sign the treaty and follow it. And there are some countries who don't care about it. And I think it's quite obvious their position. Wouldn't it be simpler to recognize that the treaty failed if some serious members of the nuclear club don't want to ratify it and don't want to have it come into force? That's my first question. Uh, when you were giving examples of uh, successful uh, cases of international cooperation, you mentioned Syria when 
uh, both countries, the US and Russia, influence the chemical weapon situation. But what about Russia is in favor of this uh, CTBT agreement? The US de facto is showing their position by not ratifying it for 20 years. Who could be this third party who could together with Russia or Russia together with this third party could influence uh, the US and China? Thank you. Well, I think that one, in international affairs, you need to have a lot of patience. And I agree with you that there may be also situations when the patience is, is running out, and 20 years is a long time. But let me remind you of the chemical weapons field. In 1925, the protocol was signed in Geneva about the non-use of chemical and bacteriological weapons, BC weapons. It was ratified by a number of states, but not ratified by a great many others, and the United States certainly did not ratify it. Well, gradually, the protocol sort of ingrained itself and became more, became almost like a norm. And so, when I was active in the Swedish government, we maintained that it was a customary rule of international law not to use chemical weapons. That is the view taken today. But in the beginning of the 90s, during the thaw, the end of the Cold War, it also proved possible to work out a con convention, a new convention against prohibiting the use of chemical weapons and the, the keeping of chemical weapons. And the US and Russia are parties to that convention. That was the basis on which they went into Syria to eliminate weapons. So that's a long story. Here now, we also see that the world is observing the moratorium against nuclear weapons. And we don't see anyone except North Korea who really seems to be tempted at the present time to go there. So gradually, you might say that the moratorium is also developing into a sort of norm, but not a complete norm, because we have a North Korean situation. And I think we have to work on that and on the risk that some new elements, some wishes in laboratories or engineers to use nuclear weapons, that it, this could break the growing norm that we have. But it's not time to give up now, on the contrary. I agree that uh, 20 years is, uh, it's been too long. And uh, what you say about uh, uh, the US, uh, I think let me add that uh, uh, President Obama has uh, uh, shown his commitment uh, when he took office in 2009 uh, to the ratification of the CTBT. But I mean, we know what democracy is at its best. Uh, so the president can have his will. Uh, but if he doesn't have the majority in the Senate, I think he doesn't get uh, to the process of securing ratification by the Senate of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. That's the situation that we have right now in the United States. But they're not giving up because they're working on the educational process and then to find a way to uh, secure the ratification. What country together with Russia could help? Uh, have envisioned, uh, that's my dream, that in the context of the DPRK, uh, you have the, if you take the P5 countries, uh, three of them have signed and ratified the CTBT. The two remaining are China and the United States. So if China, the United States, and Russia come together on the issue of the DPRK, they might be way of opening a discussion with regard to a moratorium on nuclear testing and then find a way to secure China and US ratification because we see that those two countries are potentially or supposedly watching each other with regard to the CTBT ratification. And Russia could be the bridge between those two countries in, in helping uh, towards the ratification of both China and the United States to complete the P5 under the non-proliferation treaty and uh, ratification. And that would change the dynamic with regard to this treaty you know, uh, tremendously. If I step back a little bit, when the treaty was put for signature in 96, the hope was that it will get into force no longer than three years, uh, like uh, the OPCW case. But I think it's been 20 years uh, because of this clause in Annex 2, where all 44 countries should ratify the treaty priorities entering into force. And I understand from uh, your uh, famous ambassador, Ambassador Berdenikov, today, 
uh, Grigory Berdenikov that he was at the origin of this uh, Annex 2 list. And then I was teasing him this morning. I said, okay, if you are at the, the start of this uh, close, why don't you help us to unlock uh, this situation that we are in now 20 years later? And then I think uh, that's where I'm uh, 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 asking for Russian leadership. And then I thank President Putin to have made it his priority, same as the President Hollande said it last year in February at a talk in East in France about the nuclear deterrence of France. He mentioned the CTBT as being one of the highest priority. So maybe those two can start something with regard to the CTBT and then help us with a roadmap towards its entry into force so that we don't wait another 20 years, hopefully. Oh, let me last, uh, let me ask you one last uh, question. Another sphere where preparatory commission works is helping to prevent tsunami and environmental protection. What do you do in that area? To uh, tsunami and other uh, natural disaster, uh, let, let, let me take one specific case, uh, Fukushima. Uh, if I take uh, Fukushima in 2011, uh, we're using four technology at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty to monitor a potential nuclear test explosion. And those four technologies are seismic for underground, hydroacoustic for underwater, infrasound and radionuclide for what's happening in the air, radionuclide being the smoking gun that will give the nuclear nature of an explosion. So those four technologies were put to test during the Fukushima accident. Why? Because the seismic and the hydroacoustic for the earthquake and the tsunami, the infrasound for the explosion of the nuclear power plant, and then the radionuclide for the dispersion of isotopes around the globe, that we were the only institution to be able to give an idea uh, on that, on how it's dispersed around the globe. So this is how, together with UNESCO, IOC, we've set up what we call our contribution to international tsunami warning organization, whereby we provide data from our international monitoring system to contribute to the warning system that countries are setting up in order to give an alert well in advance in the case of an earthquake and or a tsunami. But we do far more, as you said, we contribute to environment issue, to a point even we add something to climate change, because when you talk about uh, uh, ocean warming, I think we have some application that researchers are using to that effect and then many more. I think maybe uh, Dr. Bliss will want to add something to that, but I think there's far more that we can do beyond the nuclear test explosion that is our first mandate, supposedly. Now, if I were to add something, it would be to say that there is something very curious about a treaty that is in operation but not in force. It's admittedly worse if you have a treaty that is in force, but it's not in operation. It's, but it's, it's not good enough as it is. We need to get it into force. This is a part of the efforts to restrain armaments, nuclear armaments in the world. And the rest of the disarmament field is a very sad story. The, uh, the disarmament conference in Geneva has been in coma for fifth, two, two decades. Nearly. So we are very badly off, and we have a rearmament going on in, in the world, and we need to break that. There's a focusing upon nuclear security and a focusing upon a comprehensive test ban, but don't let us forget that there are also uh, something that approaching 20,000 nuclear warheads in the world, most of them in the United States and Russia together. So I think there is a tremendous responsibility for these two countries to go ahead and, and to lead. Thank you, gentlemen, for finding the time in your uh, schedule to come and visit us here at Rossiya Sevodnya. I will be glad to see you back here, and I wish you productive work here in Moscow, and goodbye. Come again. Thank you.